at the University of Leeds, she's responsible for coordinating all projects related to the evaluation of diet obesity intervention and associated to method methodological research. Mariah is a trustee member of the Association for the Study of Obesity, uh, NIHR Research Design Service Advisor for Yorkshire and the Humber, a member for the Department of Health Obesity Advisory Board, and an NIHR advisor. She also provides expertise for a number of external projects and, and bodies, including the National Obesity Observatory and the Born in Bradford Court study. Today, she will present us her interesting point of view about funding opportunities and grant applications. So please, Dr. Brian, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I suppose the reason I'm really here for this session is what I do with my other hats on. So I am a, an obesity researcher, I would call myself that, but a good proportion of my time is spent advising people um, in terms of their grant applications. I lead a module, a clinical trials module, where a huge proportion of that uh, for postdoctoral students is uh, advising on grant applications. Um, but I'm also a research design service advisor for the National Institute for Health Research in the UK. Um, and that's a that's a, a great job, actually, because I get to speak to lots of different researchers at different stages in their careers uh, from all different areas, and I'm able to sort of talk to them about where they should apply for funding or where at least I think they should apply for funding and, and the best means to do that. So I'm not going to talk very long today. Um, I'm, the remit was to do this um, from a UK perspective, but what I've done is I've added what I think to be relevant tips that cross, cross countries. Um, so in terms of career progression for funding itself, I think there's two kind of key streams for this. Uh, one is the kind of career um, funding that we've just been hearing about in the, the career development awards and fellowships that actually fund you as an individual and, and how you intend to go on. And the other is project funding. So uh, let's not forget that lots of people don't get these fellowships but do have very successful careers in research. Um, and the other way to do it is through funding in research projects. And these two are not um, mutually exclusive. So in fact, most people that have fellowships also have you know, quite a bit of other research going on. So thinking about the research project pathway, again, there are lots of different ways to get involved in this. Um, I've kind of listed them in this order. They don't have to go in this order, but it's kind of logical. Um, if you've never been involved in a research project before and you feel like that would be something that you would like to do in the future, one way in is to apply for the research assistant job and just get some you know, first-hand experience. Um, you don't have to be a co-applicant to be named on many research grants, and if you feel that you have some level of expertise that will help something quite specific, probably, um, then you can also be a named collaborator. Then there's uh, the more kind of known, I suppose, so acting as a co-applicant um, for studies that uh, crossover sites, principal investigators can be different from chief investigators, and then there's the kind of person that's in charge of everything, the chief investigator. Now, in the UK, we have a National Institute for Health Research that funds projects. Is it the red button? I think it is. Um, yeah. From basic research all the way in through translation into patient care. So really, it depends on exactly what your research question is, what your research looks like, as to where you go uh, in this kind of funny-shaped ladder. Um, and the, uh, they, they do talk to each other, these people, but the funding is uh, managed by different, different groups. Um, I actually do know most about this area here, um, but we advise on, on this and we advise on other peer-reviewed peer applications as well. Um, and, the general, and, it, and it generally does go in kind of an ordinal approach. It also includes things like research centres and facilities as well. So there's generally two types of researching uh, funding modes. One is what we call the researcher-led. That's up to you to make your mind up about what you think is important and what's going to have an impact. Uh, now, in these situations, it's really um, you, have to sh you have to demonstrate this impact. 
The commission uh, mode is where you respond to a theme that's already been um, given um, because they happen to have announced a call in an area that's very close to your research. Both of them have to be of very equal scientific quality um, and in terms of the NIHR, they have to be uh, important to the N NHS. I think if we're looking across the board at different areas, they just have to make sure you have to show impact and you know, impact is a very, very big buzzword at the moment. So within um, some of these funding streams, we do have different people doing their coordination and different and like I say, very different types of research projects. Um, probably the, I think the oldest one here is the HTA. Now that sounds for health technology assessment, but actually it's not really a technology in, in terms as some of you will understand. This is any kind of intervention really. And these are generally kind of the trials, um, but they also fund phase two research and they now fund um, systematic reviews as well. Uh, and then the others are newer uh, sorry, newer streams. This, this one here is about actually practice, so putting, putting evidence into practice, into care pathways. Um, public health research still has to show impact, um, but it can be done outside of patients, so you recruit public. Um, and then the EMU one is a, is a jointly um, commissioned project looking at mechanisms that go on to um, intervention evaluation. The CCF um, fund different types of research. Invention for Innovation, I have to say, is one I know least about, um, but it essentially is about people that have developed a really um, innovative project or technique that they think uh, has already been used uh, in a different health field or that is, is new and it has to kind of show some commercialization. The big program grants are the two million pounders. They are big multidisciplinary um, grants with big teams, normally with a chief investigator that's very prestigious. Now, as a young investigator, you can still get involved in these research grants because go and talk to the people involved, and actually what you'll find out is they need people on the ground doing the work, because what actually happens with all these people when they re meet, meet around a table is everybody says, that's really interesting, I want to do that. When it comes to it, and I'm on one of these research grants, nobody does the work. So actually what the uh, chief investigators are looking for are people that are going to prove to do the work, okay? And one way to do that is to be a named collaborator if you can't get to be a co-applicant. The programme development grants are relatively new. They're kind of a, a first step to getting a... Um, um, a program grant. And then the research of patient benefit grants are more local grants or traditionally have been more local and they really have to show involvement and benefit on patients within the time that you do them. So this, all this information actually is available online. You can get these you know, nice tables that show you if this is the type of um, phase of research you want to do. These are the sorts of funding bodies that can do it. I'm actually not sure if I agree with all of these because I did think that a phase two trial was also a feasibility study, but um, I will point you in the right direction afterwards. So in terms of fellowships, there is also quite an organized system through the Trainees Coordinating Center um, in the UK. And I, and I think I did have a quick look across different countries and there are other, other um, very similar looking graphs that actually doesn't take that much searching if you do a little quick Google search. Um, and again, these are very specific to where you are in your, whoops, wrong one, sorry. Where you are in your career path and then what kind of a researcher you are. So if you, most, most people I think um, that I see are actually researchy kind of all professional um, people, whereas we do also see people, doctors and dentists and allied health professionals as well. So really depending on um, where you are and what kind of researcher or what kind of job you do uh, really dictates which fellowship is best for you. So now I'm going to move on to the more general stuff. This is kind of the stuff that I teach on a regular basis, and I think some of it seems quite obvious, but when we see these grant applications come to us, it's amazing what people miss out, and it really does make a huge difference. And this big research question in the middle, I know how obvious does that sound? Now, I went to a presentation a couple of weeks ago um, by a very um, a successful chief investigator, and he put up his slide that said, these are my successful grant applications, and he listed them all, and it was all very exciting. Then he said, 
these are my unsuccessful grant applications, and he put his slide up, and it was completely empty. Now, actually, that's extremely rare, but he says that the reason he has had no unsuccessful grant applications, primarily, is that he got his research question right. So he didn't think about, what am I going to do to get money? He thought, what am I going to do to make an impact? And then he looked for the best way to get money to work, work out how he was going to get that impact. Okay, so, I mean, I know it's unreasonable to think that everybody can get the same kind of a trajectory, but um, I thought that was, a, that was a very good point. And then all these other things are very important, but they're not necessarily equally balanced. I think once you've got that nailed, this is the key. Get your team sorted, whether it's a fellowship or a research proposal, and do it as soon as possible. Get them talking to each other, not just to you. Now, sometimes you just have to go into people's office and bang on the door and do it one-to-one. -one. But if you can, organise meetings and get them round the table discussing the pros and cons. So uh, this is kind of the NIHR kind of talk. What makes a good application? Obviously an excellent idea. A strong candidate. Now that emphasis on that is the case for both fellowships and research grants, but especially so you have to demonstrate in your fellowships. Again, the strong team, a clear and appropriate design. That's the sort of thing that you need to get help with other people if you're not so clear. Following the guidance, it makes absolute sense, but please reprint it if you can't read on the screen and make sure you read every single word. And clarity comes up again and again and again. I'm not going to go through all of these. These are the common areas for feedback. Again, these are listed on the NIHR website, so you can um, take a look at them. Um, some of them seem obvious, some of them uh, less, less obvious. Again, this lack of clarity comes up again. So what we've done, we've got lots of people in our department, our university, that sit on these panels. So we've, we've asked them, what do you think is the most important thing? What's the make or break for applications when they come through? So the next few, or my last few slides, are just going to tell you what the, the results of that were. Does it grab attention? So right from the start, make sure you your title is right, and that you tell them what you're going to do. And when I teach, I always say to people, try to get as much information in your title as you can about your design without going too, too crazy. Um, are the objectives concise and in a logical sequence? Now, actually, the NIHR give you an awful lot of space to say what your aims and objectives are, more so than what they need to. And I would say you probably only need 50% of the characters. I wish they would give them in another area where you need a lot more. Is it uncluttered with no jargon? And this applies to all health disciplines. The people that are reviewing your panels may be experts uh, in generally in your area, but they don't necessarily know every term that you're using. Um, and so it's very important to avoid too much jargon and too many acronyms. Um, you have to demonstrate there's evidence of knowledge in this field. These people that sit on the panels, some of them are real nitpickers. They'll go and they'll look at the evidence, not just the stuff that you've given them. They'll go and talk to people and, and say, well, how come they've not put that systematic review in? That was really key. So make sure that you've included all the relevant information. Sorry, I'm really cold, which is why I'm shaking. Um, are the benefits clearly described? This again relates to impact. And have you proven cost efficiency now? I'm not quite sure what that one means. It could be cost efficiency of your project itself, in which case that's the bit that you fill in the justification for your resources. And trust me, they get some crazy stuff. You know, we need 10 laptops, that kind of thing. Um, uh, for many trials, though, it also uh, relates to um, economic evaluation. So these, honestly, were the biggest things that came out. Bad spelling and bad grammar definitely turned me off. You know, it, 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 you can have the greatest idea in the world, but if you do not portray that very clearly, it will put people off. So clarity, clarity, clarity. And these were the key reasons why they get refused. Again, the wrong research team. Make sure that everybody, that all the design aspects and the methodology of your project is mapped to an individual that's going to be responsible. So if you've got qualitative research, for example, as a key component, it really makes sense to have a qualitative expert on your team. There's also a very strong drive now for including patients. Now, they're not the people that sit in your focus groups, and it might be public as well. 
they're the people that you talk to before you write your grant application. Do you think this is an interesting idea? Get them to read the lay summary, get them to comment on anything they like. Ask them about research measures. Are you prepared to come into a lab? Now, I've got a friend that works in this area, and she tells a story of a... Um, uh, an intervention in the elderly that absolutely failed because nobody turned up. Nobody asked them when they wanted to turn up. So they told them to get there before they were allowed to use their bus passes. And so nobody turned, and this whole project failed simply on a very, something that could have been uh, discovered very early on. Um, the importance of the project is unclear again. This partly relates to clarity. I think this also relates to your aims and objectives. Um, similarly, the hypothesis is not supported by literature. Again, going back into make sure your background section is tight. Unfo plan is unfocused, hard to understand, and no relevant control group. So they seem a bit jumpy because they're actually you know, proper pieces of feedback. Potential obstacles are not discussed. So it's no good knowing, oh, crikey, I know that no one's going to come then. It's going to be really hard to recruit. Because they will know that, the people reading. And... Um, Really, the best thing to do is say, we, we are aware that there could be an issue with this, and therefore, and that's the piece where you say, these are the, obs these, these are the um, things that we're going to do to avoid that. Um, problems with methods analysis, I know that's our statistician that's focused on that. An unrealistic timeline workload. Now, lots of these funding bodies are funding you a good deal of money, and it has to be value for research. Don't skimp and scrape, to, uh, scrape too much. Be realistic in, your, in what you re require. And it's no good putting in, for example, you're doing a big multi-site trial, and I have seen this, a three-month setup period, because you won't even get your, your protocol outline written, really, in that time. So be realistic. Um, there was somebody did mention that the investigators were mentioned in the narrative but not included in the budget. I think that really is making sure that because you're filling in lots of forms, it's consistent. Um, and again, resources inconsistent relates again to being unrealistic. Uh, Overambitious recruitment, study too small, no clear primary outcome. I have to say this, I've heard quite a lot of presentations that haven't told me what the primary outcome is. And I really want to encourage people, I'm a methodologist, I really want to encourage people. This is the thing that decides whether or not your intervention works or not. Okay, this is the thing that you, that, is, that is, has driven your sample size calculation. So make that really clear. Poor design and not considering trial and data management guidelines are ignored. So um, just leave you uh, and the, from the comments to say, I did not hear of any grant being criticised for being too simple, too boring perhaps, but never too simple, provided the idea was signed. And I kind of leave you saying uh, something similar to what's been said before. Please get help. So I, like I said at the beginning, I do work for the Research Design Service. We help um, in terms of... Uh, right from the beginning. In fact, I prefer to pe see people before they've got anything down, just to really help them with their design, research design. And then we go all the way through into a grant application with them. Uh, and any help that they want, we have statisticians to help you with power calculations. We have, we have health economics, um, economists, sorry. We have uh, people that will help you do some scoping searches, PPI experts, qualitative experts. So, and it's all free, honestly, <laughs> if you're in the UK, I have to say. So we do um, uh, focus on NIHR schemes, but actually we will accept anyone um, submitting something to something uh, peer-reviewed uh, funding. I'll skip that slide. That's really just a charter for the end of the research design service. Um, and I don't really have the time to do this. I think what you'll, what the best thing to do is, if you're if you're interested in this, is to either come and see me. I'm sitting on the ASO stand quite a lot tomorrow afternoon, um, or, or just Google Research Design Service, and you'll certainly find us. Now I'm going to finish on this slide, but um, I did offer advice, one-to-one -one advice with, for people, but all the slots have gone, I'm afraid. So, um, so my my um, my kind of last message is. Still seek advice. If you're in the UK, use the Research Design Service. If you're outside of the UK, I'm sure there's equivalents. If not, people, just people that you know that have been successful. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian, for your very interesting presentation. Um, so, 
Uh, we, Amaya, Gish, and myself, have the pleasure to announce the winner of the Young Investigator United Best Thesis Award. It is worth mentioning that both candidates are brilliant researchers and we hope them to continue their scientific career at the same degree of excellence. Our decision has been taken not only by the quality of the presentation, but also by the excellence of the publications and the originality of the thesis. First, may I invite you for applause for the both candidates. <laughs> And the winner is <laughs> Dr. Dorin Zegers. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you so much. This is for you. Thank you. This is a symbol, the bird. I don't know how it's in English. Okay, <laughs> the symbol of Liverpool. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You could say something if you want. <laughs> thank your father, mother, or your supervisor. Yeah, I would like to thank everyone that has collaborated to this study. Unfortunately, I'm the only one of my research group attending this Congress this year. <laughs> so that's a little bit unfortunate. Um, but again, I want to thank both my supervisors um, for allowing me to do this research. And of course, also my family who has been supporting me throughout uh, these years, so thank you very much uh, for your attention and thank you for uh, the award. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much again to Claudia as well. Um, and uh, now the social event will be um, near the hall number three, the lobby of the hall number three, so you could follow us. And then we can have a chat, discuss scientific uh, research problems or whatever you want, of course. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you could follow us. Thank you very much.